it's my honor to welcome you to this third plenary on evidence for emerging, emerging crisis, how international collaboration and innovation can solve global humanitarian crisis, such as Ebola. I'm Pierre Ongolozogo, uh, an associate professor at the University of Yaoundé One, Cameroon, heading the Center for Development of Best Practices in Health and chair of the Evidence-Informed Policy Network uh, in Africa. And I will be chairing this session with Mark Wilson from the Cochrane, uh, the CEO of Cochrane uh, Collaboration. Uh, we had, will have for this session four speakers. Uh, one of them will be uh, with us sitting in Oslo. Uh, and for this session, we'll have then Dr. Stephen Kennedy uh, from uh, Liberia. He'll be uh, speaking about the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Did evidence make a difference on the ground for our people? So uh, Dr. Kennedy is uh, the principal investigator of ongoing trial on a, uh, a vaccine to tackle Ebola virus diseases. Dr. Stephen will share with us not only his experience as a clinician, a public health practitioner in Africa, but also somebody engaged in several international collaboration and somebody with, uh, whose passion is about uh, empowering others. So, Please let's welcome uh, Dr. Stephen for his talk on Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Did evidence make a difference on the ground? So, Dr. Stephen. Good morning to all. I bring you greetings from uh, the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Liberia. Um, we just experienced an unprecedented um, Ebola epidemic that recently ended. So um, it's important that we share lessons regarding some of the experiences and what can be done to avert um, future deterrence of such epidemics. Okay, emerging infectious diseases, re-emerging infectious diseases, we hear this terminology all along. What we know for sure is that emerging infectious diseases have been with us for a very long period of time. Um, you can see it um, looking at um, what you had. It's been with us for a very long period of time. The most important thing is that the international global community switches off and on whenever there's a key outbreak. However, the 2014 epidemics in, in West Africa took a different trend in terms of the unprecedented nature of the epidemic. As a result of that, there seemed to have been a global coordinated response um, to this epidemic. But the key question then is, what additional evidence do we need um, to be able to um, mount a significant, sustained, robust um, um, response? Um, if so, what additional evidence do we need? I was very fortunate to have been selected by the government of the Republic of Liberia to serve as one of the lead to be able to determine, to assess whether um, the country was prepared for the Ebola epidemics. And this occurred, in fact, during the early onset of the epidemic. What we did was um, we put together a 12-person team of um, diverse multidisciplinary Liberians to be able to delve into history and understand what we may have missed, what may have been the potential triggers, and what potentially can be done differently to address this issue. What you will find from this presentation will be some retrospective and some prospective presentations and findings from what we had uncovered from our work over a long period of time. One of the key things that we all know and I don't have to repeat is that 
they're searching trackers, obviously, from the West African basins. We obviously know that um, th there's a weakened health system, poor health indicators. Um, we also know that um, capacity is a problem, infrastructure is a problem. There's a high rate of poverty, and also significantly, there's a distrust in the government by the people. We know that these are determinants, okay, that are that definitely correlate to the spread of emerging, re-emerging infectious diseases. And key among them is that this is a global community. What affects your neighbor obviously has a significant impact on you. So doing epidemics, international community must come together, rally around um, most uh, vulnerable countries to be able to address these epidemics. Yes, we know that Ebola in the West African Basin did not just start in 2013. Uh, what we know is that um, you may be aware, in fact, that in the Ivory Coast, um, there was a Swiss uh, that was infected from um, working with Japan Sea. But besides that incident, uh, besides that case, there is clear evidence that Ebola has been around in the West African basis for a very long period of time. So obviously the conventional wisdom is wrong that the 2014 outbreak was the key outbreak uh, or the key evidence of Ebola in that region. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of what we did. 40 years ago, from retrospective data that was collected from 400 plus Liberians, what was interesting is that 6% of those uh, population, in fact, had antibodies to Ebola. That is about 40 years ago. So traces of Ebola footprint has been present in the West African basin, or uh, in the modern world basin for a very long period of time. What we also found out is that uh, there has been some studies that was, conduct that was published in the Journal of Virology almost about 30 plus years ago, in fact, that have observed increasing frequency in antibodies uh, to Ebola from samples that were collected from within the West African basin, specifically from Liberia. Okay, this is just a schematic of uh, the Ebola epidemics um, in the West African basin. That in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are three key take-home messages from this presentation. One is that we know that the epidemics uh, started around 1976, in the mid-70s in Sub-Saharan Africa. I bring you back to say that two years after, 76, 1978, two years after, that is 1978, there is evidence from what I just discussed that in fact there were footprints to, to Ebola virus in Liberia. That's one. The second thing is that all these countries, Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, you just name them Liberia, all these countries suffer from similar determinants. Poor health infrastructure, poor laboratory infrastructure, distrust in government, conflicts, poor conflicts, reduction in um, adequate capacity to mount adequate response. So that's across the board. The third take home message from this is that what you observe here is that in 1995, in fact, additional evidence to clearly demonstrate that in fact, Ebola has been around for a long period of time. There was a 25 years old Liberian male um, who had crossed over from the southeastern region of Liberia to the Côte d'Ivoire, which is the Ivory Coast, to a border town that is called Tabu. He fell ill. Samples collected from him were later analyzed in fact to be he was positive for Ebola. So he passed away. So all I'm trying to say in short is that this thing has been around. What we know now from the rapid cause of the spread of infectious diseases. These are exactly similar things we encounter during the epidemics in West Africa, especially in Liberia. One is that um, when the first incident occurred in the northern portion of the country had crossed over from Guinea, when the government raised an alarm 
The first thing is that the, there was a popular misconception. The public felt that it, because of the distrust in government, that it, obviously there was a strategy by the government to try to rally international support and give funding to use those funding for non-health related purposes, to be specific for corruption. There have been issues of playing cultural issues with barrier, shaking hands, how we interact with community. These cultural practices have been around in our region for a very long period of time. So obviously this is not something that came about because of the Ebola epidemic. Significant population outbursts that had occurred significantly in the country with a big rural to urban migration. These are determinants, obviously, that uh, potentiate the spread of um, infectious diseases. In short, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, one, the health system, obviously, in Africa, in West Africa, especially Liberia, was obviously vulnerable significantly to um, the Ebola epidemic, as well as em other emergence and re-emergence infectious diseases. If we know if we walk back in um, memory lane, there had been outbreak of Lassa. Liberia is one of the Lassa Bell. There had been outbreak of yellow fever. There had been outbreak of meningitis. All Ebola did was just brought this whole vulnerability to the international um, framework. The lab system has been one of the worst that we've experienced in our country. What we note, obviously, is that the lab system is structured just for curative purposes. You walk through the hospital, you samples collected from you, tested, and giving you some kind of diagnosis, you go for treatment and move. The laboratory was never prepared to be able to handle the issues of emergence and re-emergence and fracture diseases. So what we have is that we were faced with one of the most unprecedented episodes where the laboratory system was very fragmented, highly uncoordinated, significantly unprepared to be able to address this um, epidemic when it first occurred. I mean, I don't have to go into details. S samples collection was a problem. Laboring of sample was a problem. Reporting of result was a pr problem. Even diagnostic, diagnostic um, uh, apparatus non-existent. So this is a critical issue that has helped to, to affect the problem. Preparedness, obviously, we never had any blueprint to be able to prepare for emergency infectious diseases. However, I clearly indicated that there have been spontaneous outbreak of Lassa fever, yellow fever, and other emergency infectious diseases in Liberia over a long period of time. Um, so this is unusual that our preparedness and response strategy was practically non-existent. Community engagement, which played a critical role during the epidemics, what is, what is key is that community engagement by the Ministry of Health has been primarily focused on non-communicable diseases. So that has been a key focus from a preventive perspective, but more non-communicable diseases. So the epidemics obviously had to reawaken and ensure that we begin to develop infrastructure or standard operating procedures for social mobilization that look at the cultural nuances of the people from the community leadership perspective. And as I will discuss later, of the key factors that have affected the reduction of the epidemics in Liberia, obviously social mobilization, community engagement played a key role. Health workforce, I don't have to say that, the health workforce in Liberia is one of the, the worst. Um, small country, population, population of about four million, um, pr prior to the onset of the epidemics, we had about 50 to 100 doctors. Now, as I speak, we have close to 300 doctors to 4 uh, million people. Way beyond the, 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 the doctor-patient ratio that is acceptable by the World Health Organization or even any international standards. So this is, has been a problem. Quality of care, obviously, we just put a, published a paper uh, in the Lancet the differential diagnosis in sub-Saharan Africa seems to be primarily gathered around malaria, fever, malaria, fever, malaria, fever, malaria. 
Obviously, unless there's some effort to begin to keenly look at the differential diagnosis of fever in the sub-region, especially in West Africa, we will continue to miss the eventual triggers that are associated with emerging infectious diseases. The outbreak in West Africa, obviously what happened is that came from Guinea, in six months, bam, the entire uh, three most affected countries were highly affected. I mean, the whole region, in six months, Ebola was everywhere. So the key message is that um, if you look at this slide, there's government distrust, as I said, from Liberia. You see Ebola 1, government 0. Um, there's an outbreak. Or it says that when there's a problem at your neighbor's door, obviously, make sure you pay attention because you could be next. This is just a schematic diagram. Don't make anything of it. What they're trying to say that 2014, in the 21st century, we are still using simple case-finding methodology, simple, old-fashioned epidemi epidemiological strategy to be able to trace cases. We're in, the 20, we're in the 21st century. We should be talking about GIS, mapping, much more sophisticated diagnostic procedures to be able to, to clearly lay out these things. But it shows that we have been ignored. We've now considered emerging disease as, uh, as a key priority. So as a result, we had to do what we had to do may not have been the most appropriate strategy in the 21st century, but we had to do what we had to do to be able to address this epidemic. So all this is telling you is that we could do better, but because of limited infrastructure, limited resources, limited capacity, distrust in government, poverty, high rate of illiteracy, these are the kind of things we were doing in our country. Future deterrence, how do we address that? Obviously now, from all those data that I have given you to clearly indicate that Ebola has been around in Liberia for over 40, for about 40 years. So now, since the 2014 epidemic brought the global attention together, which is very short-lived, now the government has decided to set up a strategic investment plan to be able to come up with a key long-term deterrent strategy to ensure that we do not encounter such an issue again. So what you see is that there are about nine key thematic areas. Uh, and this one is the one that's clearly related to the epidemics. Okay, um, so what this did was is led to the establishment of the National Public Health Institute in Liberia. The National Public Health Institute, from what we trying to put together, eventually will be a game changer to be able to respond to epidemics, prevent future outbreak, to be able to build capacity, build infrastructure, to be able to quick diagnosis, um, and to be able to appropriately address case management and treatment protocol, clinical trial based on standard operating protocol and procedure that have been developed. So basically, this is the message I'm trying to get across. There were missed signals, there was missed triggers. Um, international community seems to be very myopic in terms of epidemics. So um, it is our responsibility as the current uh, public health worker, resources, community worker, epidemiologists, what, anthropo anthropologists, whatever, to ensure that we, uh, we institute appropriate mechanism, appropriate strategy to ensure that our kids don't suffer from what we have encountered at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. For those doing measurement in the room, we have to find indicators for country preparedness for epidemics. Uh, I, I will now invite Vasi Mothi to give his uh, presentation on the global research and development response to the Ebola outbreak. What did we learn? Dr. Vasi Mothi is currently working uh, with the research ethics knowledge of tech at the Information and Evidence Research at WHO in Geneva, but he has uh, 
experience from South Africa and the Gambia where he's been practicing. So please, Dr. Vassi, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to the organizers for, for inviting me. It's such a, a privilege to be at such an important meeting in Africa, in South Africa. Um, for me personally, my clinical career started when I worked as a, uh, a general medical officer for the South African government in rural KwaZulu-Natal in the mid-90s, so it's wonderful to be here. I'm here to um, share a summary of the Ebola vaccine story um, from WHO's perspective and let you know about the ongoing World Health Organization R&D blueprint for action to prevent epidemics that really arose out of that Ebola crisis, making a commitment that we would um, harness the, the energy and the urgency that was employed for the Ebola R&D response. And, it's, uh, and thank you so much to Stephen for the very, very important um, words. Do what we can to ensure that we can put whatever can be put into place in the inter-emergency period to avoid these big peaks and troughs, um, focusing on the R&D response. So if we go back to 2014, I'm going to start in April 2014, before the emergency was declared, when being frank, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, GSK, came to WHO, um, said to us they had a platform that could potentially be used in, in Ebola for vaccines, had not been into a single human um, for evaluation for Ebola vaccines. And at that time, the emergency hadn't been declared. We did not have a way to engage outside of business as usual um, in, in that context. That has completely changed now, and that's what the R&D blueprint is. So when the emergency was declared in August of 2014, as Stephen said, there were a number of global convenings to come to agreement about the options for how we can proceed, um, both on the emergency response side, but also on the R&D side. For vaccines, we were fortunate in that there were generally agreed criteria, and all we can do at WHO is based on the consensus from the scientific research public health communities of, uh, that you are a part of. And what the consensus was that we luckily, largely thanks to the work of the US NIH and the Canadian Public Health Agency, there were already two vaccines that by happenstance had been manufactured to clinical grade and were ready to be evaluated and had very compelling data preclinically in, uh, in non-human primates, but really very novel um, technologies. So we accelerated the evaluation by bringing all resources to bear on an emergency basis. And this is Mary Paulkini, who was our Assistant Director General, who was leading this. Now, um, as you, I think you would know, the norm for vaccine evaluation outside of, of, of an emergency would be to go through this sequential process, and it takes something like 10 to 20 years from the very first phase one trial starting to the safety and effectiveness and all of the data that's needed to enable policy decision making and ultimately financing and access. And in, in the Ebola context, after the emergency was declared, there were a number of innovations, including essentially everything happening in parallel. So the manufacturing preclinical pre um, assay release, phase one trials in different settings, phase three, the preparations for policy deployment, financing, all of these discussions were happening in parallel. And by doing this, um, with the important work in Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, ultimately we ended up with the interim results from the ring vaccination trial that I'll be mentioning in Guinea, um, and that took 11 months, 10 months from the very first person actually being vaccinated with that product, which is far, far faster than has ever been achieved for any other novel vaccine product previously in, in recent decades, but also too late um, for that particular um, epidemic. And if there's one, if there's one um, area that, at, after me, uh, John Arna Rottingham is going to talk about CEPI, which in a way arose from financing discussions that um, were initiated as part of the R&D blueprint. If, if we can have phase one clinical data on promising vaccine candidates available to um, guide decisions about dosing, numbers of doses, then we can go forward with investigational stockpiles of vaccines available to accelerated um, effectiveness evaluations of experimental products in, in epidemics. And that, would, that could have made a, a big, big difference, and we have um, great hopes that we're going to be able to proceed down that track. Uh, moving forward. So how were we able to meet these 11-month timelines compared to 10 to 20 years? Um, the global community mobilized around the emergency response. These are the sorts of constituencies that all need to come together for clinical development. Manufacturers stepped up and engaged 
um, without really any prospect of financial return. Major pharmaceutical companies did this, and finding a sustainable way to maintain their engagement is going to be critical, and CEPI and others are, going, are a critical part of that. Funding agencies made decisions within 48 hours in some instances to support this, this response. Regulators went into an emergency mode and really became facilitatory. Ethics committees made decisions in 72-hour timeframes. Um, there was a whole global network of investigators, scientists, both from the clinical, the, the laboratory, the data management side, independent oversight. All of this happened in record speed. What was one interesting thing was when you stress the whole global system, and I was involved with some of this coordination, was what can be accelerated and what actually can't. And we saw that the, the legal agreements were coming to agreement between um, the lawyers in different institutions actually was not able to be compressed as, as much as, as some of the other areas. So we really need to work on setting up some of these um, template agreements ahead of time. This is one slide on the, the three big global phase one Ebola vaccine consortia that were put together over a couple of weeks in August of 2014, focusing on the three leading vaccine candidates. Um, the GSK Chempat 3 candidate, the, the Merck, what became the Merck VSV candidate, and Johnson & Johnson with their R26 MVA program. Um, and this, in some senses, is, was a huge success, and I just thank from the bottom of my heart all of the many, many people who dropped what they were doing and made this happen so that we had the phase one information that could lead to the phase three evaluation. If you take a step back, this, as I said, could be considered a failure of the system because we should have had this phase one data available. These vaccines were sitting on the shelf and they, they had not been evaluated ahead of time and we need to address that going forward. So leading into the Ebola Sasufi um, Guinea uh, vaccine effectiveness trial together with the important trials in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, so these are the steps that led into this, where we came to consensus on some eth major eth ethical considerations or laid out options where, I mean, let's not pretend that we could come to agreement at the global level about everything, but we, we laid out areas of consensus and um, where there were disagreements and what the options were. This led to some agreement about how to proceed, and we then had um, a high-level meeting in late October 2014 where the Guinean authorities had asked us at WHO for help in how they proceed. We put together a global group of methodologists and topic experts, Ebola scientists, vaccine experts, um, regulators, ethicists, and they decided that the best option taking into account the, the situation on the ground in Guinea was to go with the ring design, which is a type of cluster randomized design where the clusters are not geographically based, but they're based on the contact network, the contacts and the contacts of contacts of confirmed Ebola virus disease cases. And this design hadn't been used for some decades before this trial, but we think there is great, um, a case for greater use of this design going forward, particularly in outbreaks. Protocols and financing were put in place over a couple of months, and all this essentially, and then there was the choice of the vaccine using criteria based on manufacturing availability and the phase one data that we'd been scrambling to develop over the few months before that. And this all culminated in nine months from the decision to, to um, go ahead to the preliminary results being available and the independent oversight committee deciding that it was no longer appropriate to randomize um, because the, the, it, it was a randomized design between immediate and delayed vaccination. Um, the trial continued with immediate vaccination from that point onwards and that the, it was extended into Sierra Leone and those results were published in, in The Lancet. The key innovation of the trial design is that the enrollment in the trial is based on where the outbreak and the confirmed cases are occurring geographically. And this was really important because it was over a very wide area. Um, and so it w this particular trial, we wouldn't have been able to answer the efficacy outcome if we had had fixed site enrollment. And we think we need to look into other um, situations where this, can, this type of approach can be used. The headline primary outcome that was published in The Lancet was a point estimate of vaccine efficacy of 100% with a lower 95% um, confidence interval of 74.7% with um, much wider um, confidence intervals around the effectiveness, as you'd expect. In parallel, the, um, from before this time, there were major discussions about practical guidance on de deployment of, of Ebola vaccines that were being developed. So now, just to go into the R&D blueprint, this is what we have set up since to harness the Ebola experience and for outbreak R&D preparedness. We have a global coordinating mechanism where the 
the key issue here is that when an outbreak occurs, we need to have some coordination. Nobody wants to be coordinated, but I think everybody understands the need for some coordination. And if you have 10 different groups going to a country where there is the actual emergency response, the last thing they need is to be distracted by multiple different groups going in, saying that you should be testing our candidate. So clearly the in-country authorities need to, to primacy in their decision about which ones to use, but we all, also the global community needs to have some coordination of that. And so this is a mechanism that we se we've set up to, it to help with that. We're accelerating R&D processes for a, a list of 10 pathogens um, that we think are, are likely to emerge in the future. And there's a prototype research and development roadmap which lays out the research, product development, policy, commercialization activities that are needed that was published in Nature Medicine in, in mid-2016, and we're, we're developing these in the other areas. That leads to us in WHO, this is an innovation, where we get out from behind the table, I won't literally c get out from behind the table because the microphone's here, um, and we engage with the, with the development community and, and with our network of scientists, and we say, look, these, if you want to meet the critical public health need in developing countries, these, this is the critical indication terminating transmission, pretending, pr pr providing long-term protection for deploying health workers, for example, the local health workers most importantly, the target groups, um, the types of safety and effectiveness information, durability of protection, stability, the vaccine presentation. We now are providing what we would like to see and the development community can, can align that with what they are developing so that hopefully we can accelerate greatly the timelines to not only licensure, which is what the um, developers tend to focus on, but actually the subsequent steps towards use in, in developing countries. We have six of these available for Ebola, uh, multivalent filovirus multi vaccines, including Marburg, Zika, MERS coronavirus, Lassa, and Nipah. And this has all happened over the last um, six months or so. We also have a major regulatory preparedness stream where we're convening the in-country national regulatory authorities through our networks to support them in thinking about how they're going to go about review processes next time there's a big outbreak. And then we have a number of um, methodological discussions around trial design, endpoints, protocol development with groups of, of experts. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are involved in these which are focused on Ebola, Zika, now MERS coronavirus, and we'll be moving into Lassa and other areas. And then the last main part of my talk is, is to say that as we, as I personally and others went through the Ebola R&D response, we saw that there were really critical systemic issues related to sharing of information, uh, methods, results, data, which needed to happen as soon as possible in the emergency so that we understood the nature of the pathogen, we understood the transmission characteristics, we could initiate the public health response, and we could think about access to ca countermeasures. And there were a number of structural issues in, in access to to results and data. This is one slide from a, um, a study that looked at the ac access to results from studies of pandemic um, vaccine trials from the 2009 pandemic. And many of you will be familiar with this. When there's a big crisis, early on, there'll be some one or two big um, publications that are in the New, e New England Journal of Medicine or The Lancet. And then later on, there's a, a dropping off in the, the uh, speed of, of publication, partly because the impact factor goes down um, the, the longer you are away from um, the epidemic. But those, all of the information is really equally important for the evidence process and for decision making. So there's, there are some major biases here. And that there are many other issues um, in data sharing and in outbreaks and emergencies. And so we, we convened specific on this topic specifically a large group of stakeholders in 2015. And we came to consensus that there just is a need to change information sharing in this space. And that fed directly into a statement that was made by a large number of bodies when the Zika emergency was declared. Those um, had been at the WHO meeting and those principles for more timely, transparent sharing of, of data and results in emergencies, I think are, are being followed on now. One concrete example of what, what came out of that meeting, um, just to give you it tried to give you the sense that this is not about having meetings, it's about identifying concrete ways to move forward and advance science and public health, is that we agreed that having journal embargoes which limit the ability to disseminate information is a problem anyway, um, but 
is a particular problem in, in the context of emergencies where things are evolving every day. I mean, when I was going into work and then I left work on the same day, the world obviously uh, often seemed like a different place in, the, in August 2014. So to be waiting three months for the journal to come out is just completely unacceptable. So we took the consensus from this meeting in 2015 and we wrote from WHO to the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, asked them to change their wording, and they did. And they have, they, there's explicitly now on the ICMJ website the wording in the event of a public health emergency, information with immediate implications for public health should be disseminated without concern that this will preclude subsequent consideration for publication. So we have a lot more work to do on, on enabling the right ways for pre-publication pre information sharing. We also have been working on um, clinical trials reporting. So we convened major funders and 20 of them showed leadership by signing up to this commitment, which is on our website, that of the three elements to develop within their policies requirements for prospective clinical trial registration, which still doesn't occur much of the time, even though it's been the WHO position since 2005, specifying time frames appropriate for their local jurisdiction for results disclosure, that it's something that you need to disclose the results if you do a clinical trial. Not, this is not only in journals, but also, for example, in the results sections of registries, and the registries we see really as an underutilized resource in this whole space, and we have a session on this on Saturday um, called Access to Research Results for Decision Making, so I hope you'll come to that. And then finally, that the, you know, the real change, I think, will come when all research, and res I, I come from a research background, so I know how incredibly busy everybody is. Your incentive structure is around you know, getting grants and publishing and, and high impact journals, but if we all see as a core quality criteria of our own work that we have publicly disclosed all of the results from our previous research, we think that would make a big difference. And um, the major public funders from the UK, France, Norway, India, the Indian Council of Medical Research, um, the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust and, and many others are, are part of those that have shown leadership here. We also have a, a big scope um, that I'll skip over on sample sharing and biobanking that you could discuss with me um, if you'd like. So my conclusions are that the R&D blueprint represents our commitment to work outside business as usual, taking innovative approaches to advance timelines for availability and access of medical countermeasures that can prevent the progression of future epidemics. Through the blueprint, we seek to retain elements of the urgency inherent in emergency responses and employ this urgency during the inter-emergency period so that we're better prepared from the R&D perspective. Our core principles um, include working for the benefit of those in affected countries, that's why we exist, timeliness, transparency, accountability, access for those most in need. Now, collaboration comes out again and again as being really important in the utility of research in epidemics as elsewhere and in the, in the R&D preparedness. So somehow we need to balance the competitive element that is inherent in science and research, which has major benefits and drives innovation with the need um, for collaboration. And we can all work together on this. And there's much more to do. And we have some concrete proposals on ensuring that critical information is shared in a timely and transparent manner. And I'd just like to acknowledge our stellar strategic advisory group, which is chaired by Jeremy Farrar, the head of the Wellcome Trust. All those of you, you were part of this community that advise and contribute to our work. All we're doing as, as the Secretariat is reflecting the work of, of the, the, the scientific, regulatory, public health communities, which is the big WHO that we work to serve. And all those who answered the call um, for this collaborative work from WHO during Ebola and afterwards, including Stephen and, and hundreds of others. Um, and there you have our contact details. I've covered a, a vast amount in this talk, and if you'd like to um, get in touch with us for more details about any of these work streams, please don't hesitate to do so. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is, by the wonders of modern technology, joining us from Oslo in, uh, in Norway. Uh, Jon Arno Rottingham is the Chief Executive of the Research Council of Norway, an adjunct professor at the Department of Global Health and Population in Harvard. His areas of expertise include working with health policy and health systems, with a particular emphasis on how evidence can inform global decision making. Just before he speaks to us, there's going to be a, a short film that will introduce his, his uh, keynote title, entitled The Establishment of CEPI, a new broad co co coalition for developing vaccines to stop future epidemics. John Anna Rottingham. This one started with a bat, a tree, and a boy called Emil, a life full of wonder, and a world 
about to explode. Soon after, he fell sick. And his family did too. Disease spread further still. Uncertainty led to fear. Epidemics affect us all. They affect anyone. At any time. They don't care about borders. Or nations. They are one of our greatest threats. And with our dense cities, easy travel, and ecological change, they spread faster and further than ever before. Businesses close and airports shut. Billions are spent and loved ones lost. The sound of a cough <coughs> becomes the worst sound of all. We've sent people into space, created incredible structures, and connected the world in ways we never dreamed. But we're yet to outsmart epidemics. We're always a step behind. Because we don't plan, we react. We know vaccines can protect us. We just need to be better prepared. So let's come together. Let's research and invest. Let's save lives. Let's, let's outsmart, outsmart epidemics. epidemics. Thank you to the organizers of the Global Evidence Summit for inviting me to, to give this talk. I'm very sorry for not being able to be with you in person today. What I would tell you now is the story of the establishment of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which came out of the Ebola outbreak in many ways. Because what happened was that CEPI was created in this window of opportunity. We had the problem stream. We had the problems demonstrated with a devastating epidemic. We had solutions. We demonstrated also within the epidemic that it is possible to do research and development in the midst of a crisis. And then we had political understanding and political visibility of the crisis. And together, these three streams came together and created the opportunity. I told you the problem is evident. This picture and many, many more traveled the world and really told the world about the, all the victims of the Ebola outbreak. It also told the story that we were not prepared. We were not prepared to respond and we were not prepared to, with technologies, with medicines, with vaccines and diagnostics ahead of time. Then we did test Ebola vaccines during the outbreak. And the testing of the Ebola vaccine in Guinea, the ring vaccination trial, turned out to be a successful story. However, this indicates the time where we started planning the trial uh, from late uh, October, November 2014 uh, until the study was implemented in the field. And when this is overlaid on the epidemic curve, uh, we see that the trial actually was just on the margin of the epidemic. What we sh really should have done, of course, was to be able to start this trial and other trials, both treatment trials and vaccine trials, much earlier, ahead of the epidemic curve. This would, of course, have created a very different situation with the opportunity to test vaccines and other treatments in the midst of the epidemic. But then we would have needed to be prepared. So the Ebola outbreak really identified the need for more global solutions in the space of R&D. And all the high-level panels, which are presented more or less in this slide, called for the same. We need a better system to be able to prepare and respond to crisis when it comes to research and development for new health products. CEPI was created in this window of opportunity. Uh, after the WHO R&D blueprint process really created a good platform, but with additional discussions, we assembled a group of high-level leaders, both from the public sector, from international governmental organizations, from civil society, NGOs like MSF and others, in Davos at the World Economic Forum, together with business leaders from the big vaccine companies. 
I will not go in detail in the process, but in the time of a year from January 2016 until January 2017, we were able to mount a good planning process, we established the organization and we raised the necessary funds. Uh, so the first spring, we all did all the preparatory work. I had the opportunity to be appointed as the interim director in June 2016. We convened the first board meeting in August in London 2016, and we gradually launched CEPI in dialogue with G7 health ministers, in dialogue with the UN General Assembly uh, high-level meetings, um, and we had the launch at the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in January 2017. And at that meeting, the same stakeholders, the leaders from governments, uh, the leaders from international governmental organizations, from NGOs and from industry came together and launched CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. So what is CEPI? CEPI is a, then a true partnership of public, private and philanthropic organization together with NGOs and civil society. The role of CEPI is now to stimulate, finance and coordinate vaccine development against priority threats that are defined and ahead of time, uh, and particularly when development is unlikely to occur due to market incentives alone, where there are clear market failures, either because we do not see the threat ahead of time or there is no real big commercial market. The strategic objectives of CEPI is to be prepared and to also be able to respond quickly. Be prepared in the sense that we will identify the epidemic diseases that are most likely to occur and be prepared by taking these vaccines candidate forward through phase one and phase two trials before epidemics are occurring, because of course they can be tested in phase one and two trials without an ongoing epidemic. And then be able to respond quickly in the midst of an epidemic to actually do the necessary efficacy trials, the effectiveness trials, uh, the phase three trials during the epidemic. But we also know that we do not necessarily know and can predict all new epidemics. There may be new viruses, there may be viruses that we really didn't predict to be the uh, important ones. Then we need response speed to also really develop new vaccines on established platforms when there are new epidemics arising. To be able to do this, the coalition identified more predictability of the system as a key objective. Predictability of how we should collaborate and work together, predictability of the regulatory environment, predictability of the ability to actually test the candidates during the, the pipelines and in an epidemic, and predictability when it comes to a capacity to stockpile and be able to distribute vaccines in the case of future epidemics. And then the final objective, the key objective in the business plan of CEPI is equity, making sure that everyone who would need these technologies, vaccines, but also potentially in the future diagnostics and therapeutics, that all in need would be in priority to receive them. And also making sure that CEPI in its establishment and in the way we operate could involve all countries and capacities in different geographic regions. So CEPI, we see CEPI to have an end-to-end gap-filling role in an existing system through a partnership or a coalition approach. So CEPI has a role as a funder, a financing mechanism, first and foremost in the clinical development phase. So CEPI will not fund discovery science, not fund the upstream research that is needed, both to develop new vaccines and also to develop new vaccine technologies. But it will develop the quite costly clinical development. It will finance the quite costly clinical development of vaccines. Um, and then we hope that other organizations, and CEPI is in systematic dialogue with the other organizations, including Gavi, UNICEF and others, when it comes to taking the role of delivering and stockpiling vaccines for future needs. But in addition to having a 
funding role, SEPI is also set up to have a goal to facilitate this end-to-end -end spectrum from discovery through clinical development, licensure, manufacturing, delivery and stockpiling. Because there was a clearly identified need to have a common ground, to have a dialogue across the full development and the full research process from early discovery to delivery. And SEPI could play this role as a neutral broker, as a mechanism to gather both private sector industry, biotech companies, big companies, but also academia, regulators and others. So SEPI also developed a set of operating principles, which would be key in particular to deliver the equity dimension of the four strategic objectives. Uh, because adhering to equitable access and making sure that the vaccines that come out of CEPI or CEPI funding are affordable and available to those that need them. That's a key uh, um, uh, prime principle of CEPI and how uh, CEPI operates. And it's written into um, all contracts and agreements with uh, manufacturers and developers that CEPI fund. Second, we also want to secure part industry participation because we believe that to really develop vaccines, there needs to be involvement both of private and public sector. And then we need predictable pathways of how a vaccine candidate can develop through early clinical development, through advanced clinical development, and actually through a predictable uh, regulatory mechanism. And we need risk benefit sharing arrangements and also handling the liability through indemnification mechanisms to make sure that there is clarity on who's taking which risks and who will earn the benefits. And the main point is that we all need to earn the main benefits together in a shared arrangement. And finally, to make sure that research and development happens in a mechanism where we can learn as much as possible SEPI is supporting data sharing and sample sharing mechanisms and development of regional and national capabilities for epidemic vaccine preparedness as a part of the way uh, the vaccine development will happen. SEPI has uh, now, through a detailed process, identified three priority target diseases to prepare for. That's MERS, it's Lassa fever and Nipah. And the starting point for this priority setting was a strong collaboration and key collaboration with the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, through its R&D blueprint that Vasi have described now, uh, defined a list of priority pathogens. Among that list, SEPI needed to down-select so that through limited resources, we prioritized the diseases or the epidemics where their vaccines can contribute most. So we chose the Scientific Advisory Committee of CEPI chose these three initial diseases based on public health impact of a potential vaccine, the risk of an outbreak occurring in the future, and also feasibility of vaccine development with the uh, specific candidates for these diseases. CEPI then has now had a call for proposal out for vaccine development for these three diseases, MERS, Lassa fever, and Nipah virus. The first deadline was 8th of March, there was a first assessment of preliminary proposals and then the best uh, proposals were uh, selected for a more detailed uh, submission uh, in July 2017. And the CEPI Secretariat has now based on uh, advice from the Scientific Advisory Committee. They are uh, in the process of making the final decisions on this first round on vaccine development for MERS, Lassa and Nipah. Then CEPI just launched as well a call for proposals on vaccine platform technologies to make sure that we have this response mode capability to respond quickly, also when there are new epidemics occurring. And this has a deadline of 70th of October and is informed by an open request for information on vaccine technology platforms. And finally, we have not finished the job on Ebola. There are no vaccines still that have regulatory approval, even if we have positive clinical efficacy data. Uh, so there is need to make sure that we have sufficient data so that regulators are able to get clear regulatory decisions on how uh, we should use Ebola vaccines in the future, 
and which ones to use. And that may also need additional funding and uh, CEPI is in dialogue uh, with all actors regarding this. So finally, CEPI is a joint mechanism. It's a partnership. It's a coalition. Uh, the world is investing together because it's a risk sharing mechanism. Because we do not know where the next outbreak will hit. We do not know which pathogen it will be. Uh, and we know that resources are constrained and limited. So in finance terms, if we were finance ministers or bankers, we would see this as a need to collateralize and securitize investments and to share risks as a global community. The concept of sharing risk is inherent to national health systems. Now the emphasis on universal health coverage as a risk sharing mechanisms in nations, in countries, is a key priority for most countries and also for the new Director General of the World Health Organization. For global health security, we also need global risk sharing mechanisms. And we need these mechanisms to be across countries at the global level. We need this to make sure that we have capabilities, know-how and expertise and institutional capacities to prevent, detect and respond to outbreaks. But not only that, also to invest in R&D for biomedical countermeasures like diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. And CEPI is such a mechanism because pay as you go. So actually just paying the costs of not investing in preparation will be too costly and will be more, much more costly for the world than actually being prepared and investing in public health systems and investing in research and development ahead of time. CEPI has been able to mobilize this a sense of urgency and the need to invest together. CEPI's first investors are the governments of Japan, Norway and Germany. And together with the foundations, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, we're able to mount a bit more than $500 million uh, for the five, first five years when they were launched in Davos. Then later, Canada, Australia, um, Belgium, uh, and another investment from Norway has now increased the funding to a level of more than $600 million. Uh, but it's still not enough. We, need, we have estimated that to actually take forward the first business plan, including the vaccines for these three priority diseases and vaccine technology platforms, we would need a $1 billion investments over the five-year period. So there's still a step uh, to go. Um, and to actually spread the need to invest together is an important message. And to spread that news and that message, uh, we've been extremely supported by one of the world leaders, uh, German, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, has really made pre preventing epidemics and preparing for epidemics, including R&D response and including coalitions like CEPI, one of the key priorities of her agenda on global health. Uh, and this is now also a part of the G20 agenda during the German presidencies. And we hope this will contribute to the final goal of mounting sufficient financial support for CEPI. But finally, vaccines is not enough. CEPI started off with vaccines. We will need to make sure that other technologies, diagnostics and therapeutics, and the research for them is also funded. And CEPI may provide a useful platform to do so. So thank you, science, we can say after the experience of the Ebola outbreak. The R&D response was better in total than the public health response, we should say in afterthought. But we can do so much better. CEPI is a mechanism, a platform for doing better together. Uh, and we hope that that can really make sure that we as a scientific community, as a total global health community, can deliver much better in future epidemics. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jody Nelson. Jody is a Senior Vice President of Policy and Practice at the International Rescue Committee, uh, where she's founded the IRC's Department of Research, Evaluation and Learning, and has worked on strengthening the quality of data used to affect and measure change in post-conflict countries. Before that, she worked at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for six years, working across program areas in global health and development. Jody. Thank you. 
I am delighted to be here today, uh, focused with all of you on how to advance the use and generation of evidence to address key health and social challenges. Uh, I'm speaking today from perhaps a different perspective than what we've heard to date or already uh, from a perspective of an implementer, a humanitarian agency that works in many contexts around the world. IRC in particular works in conflict-affected and post-conflict environments. I've been focused on the topic of evidence and humanitarian aid for most of my career. As recent as 10 or 15 years ago, I would have been shocked to see these three things on one agenda. Evidence, uh, organized by the Cochrane Collaboration, a seminal systematic review and dissemination organization, and humanitarian aid. The debate then in our sector was a heated one about whether humanitarian context could coexist with what was seen as the luxury and doubtful ethics of rigorous research. At the same time, some of what passed for evidence of impact, I quote that, or intervention effectiveness, was concerning to many of us. As head of research and evaluation at a large NGO then, I frequently reviewed evaluations of the so-called impact of a particular program. Typically, a consultant from London, DC, or New York would visit one of our country programs, a conflict or post-conflict country, for about 18 days. They would interview uh, key staff and donor missions on the ground and conduct focus groups. They would then write up a long report that stated the intervention had or had not achieved positive change in people's lives. The evaluations consistently conflated objectivity with the opinion of a few people, reflected a lack of understanding of good principles of inquiry and methodology, and seemed to have no observable imprint on our own decision making or that of donors in the future. The setting is different today. We no longer debate whether we need evidence. And the call to make humanitarian aid more effective over the last two to three years emphasizes the need to prioritize evidence of different kinds. Joint needs assessments that use descriptive evidence of the greatest needs, measuring outcomes toward progress, and, in, and an increase in the causal evidence we can generate through research to identify what works and at what cost. Where there were only a handful of us ten, 10 years ago, many today, many agencies have research capacity. There are new organizations such as Evidence Aid and 3IE dedicated to synthesis and dissemination and a growing number of social science partners. There are also a select group of philanthropies keen to support not only our implementation, but also our efforts to contribute to the sector with cumulative evidence we can all use. At the IRC, this aspiration to use and generate evidence is central to our organizational strategy. We work to assure that all of our programs are either evidence-based or evidence-generating. To achieve this, we have developed tools to inform program design across our country programs. Our outcomes and evidence framework, which is available and open source online, defines five high-level outcomes we aspire to achieve in our context. They have theories of change, associated indicators, and interventions that are graded according to the strength of evidence. We expect our teams to choose interventions based on the best available evidence from a combination of stable and conflict settings. We rate evidence and have organizational research priorities that represent the most pressing gaps to fill, where new evidence will improve our own and others' impact on people's lives. But the progress that we or other individual organizations can make is insufficient. Simply put, the needs are too great for us not to know more. Consider a map of the world's humanitarian crises today. It's worth emphasizing that crises continue to burn while new ones get added. While the Syrian conflict has become center stage for many of us over the last seven to eight years, violent conflict and a growing health crisis burn in Yemen, ongoing conflict and famine continue to motivate millions to flee borders from southern Sudan. Lake Chad Basin region is awash in internal conflict and suffering and violence and terrible economic conditions still face people living in DR Congo and the Central African Republic, among others. P 
people living in Liberia and Sierra Leone, the focus of today's conversation in part, are still grappling with the combination of having survived years of civil war and the ruin of Ebola. At the same time, the politics of decision-making about aid budgets put at risk the chance we have to meet people's needs effectively. Driving, we aspire to drive toward measurable changes in their lives and use evidence to decide where the most value for people for the same amount or less money can be gained. In this context of growing needs and politicized decision making, the speed with which humanitarian aid is becoming evidence-based is too slow. Today I follow uh, esteemed colleagues talking about the collaboration possible to generate evidence related to vaccine efficacy and effectiveness. There's no doubt the Ebola case underscores both the imperative to do this and the progress possible when there's a joint commitment by big players. Big players from the private sector, from the public sector, from academia and philanthropic communities. This caliber of collaboration and investment is unsurprising because Ebola piqued dramatic concerns of health security in the West. But the evidence story is different outside of drug development. In humanitarian settings, our effort to support communities to educate their kids, prevent violence against women and children in homes and communities, achieve even a modicum of economic well-being, and assure that all quality health services reach people continue to suffer from a dearth of relevant evidence. The Ebola case in part highlights some of what stands in our way. Although the Ebola outbreak was unique in many cases that we've heard about today, many people have reflected upon how the international response resembled many others, as in Haiti, in Aceh after the tsunami, or in many of the man-made crises where IRC works, International resources tend to be allocated without reference to real-time data, ongoing experience, or practitioner expertise. In the end, aid organizations are locked in a position of hindsight. We look through the rearview mirror to see what we knew when and how the system didn't respond adequately. From a broader humanitarian perspective, what happened to people living through Ebola in West Africa is what happens to other people living through dramatic, awful crises, whether they are outbreaks, natural, or man-made disasters, such as conflict and ongoing displacement. As was the case in West Africa, violence in the home and in communities increase. As the Ebola virus swept across West Africa, so did outbreaks of rape, sexual assault, and violence against women and children. In Sierra Leone, for example, recorded cases of sexual and domestic violence were higher in 2014 than in previous years. Teenage pregnancy, an indicator of violence, increased by up to 65% in some communities. This is not unusual in the context in which IRC works. Our service delivery data reveal that prevalence of intimate partner violence in times of conflict is likely to be even higher than what is already an astro astronomical average globally. Recent data show that close to 40% of women and girls who sought services in camps and settlements in South Sudan, Kenya, and Iraq have experienced intimate partner violence. That's by people they know. In addition, kids suffer from poor quality and access to education. Still recovering from years of civil war and poverty when Ebola hit, an already weak education system in West Africa meant that more than two million children missed out on much of their school year. This too is not uncommon in IRC settings. There are approximately 62.5 million children, adolescents, and youth out of school across 32 conflict-affected countries where we work. Over 60% of school-age refugee children don't have access to education. And even when schools are available, conflict-affected children face multiple barriers to access and learning that include lack of trained teachers and the negative effects that trauma and toxic stress have on their social and emotional well-being. Finally, as was the case in Ebola, health infrastructure and services are often too weak to reach families. Access to health care is a consistent obstacle for people. Successful efforts to decrease childhood mortality due to preventable diseases are not reaching people living in conflict and crisis settings where health infrastructure and services are scarce. Children are twice as likely to die before reaching their fifth birthday. And networks of community health workers 
often have very low capacity and education, causing real gaps in effective coverage of even proven interventions. I offer these details to help drive a discussion beyond the need and power of vaccines and to make the case that we need the same type of collaboration in these areas to generate evidence that fills critical gaps in our knowledge base about how best to improve people's lives. The evidence to date just isn't sufficient. This slide offers a snapshot and probably a superficial one of where we stand in terms of experimental evidence, the evidence that we use most to decide about the cost effectiveness of different interventions in conflict settings. In the last decade, approximately 120 rigorous evaluations have been conducted in these settings, compared to over 4,000 in stable, low, and middle-income countries. Out of those 120, the IRC has contributed to or directly been involved in 20, and we're in the process of running an additional 17 right now. I'm thrilled to represent an organization that is one of the largest single contributors to the evidence base in conflict and refugee settings. But real success will be when I can stand here and say that there's a robust evidence base generated by and with numerous NGOs reflecting partnership with major universities that have incentivized their faculty to focus on applied research and solutions, supported by public and private donors aligned with practitioners on specific research programs that relate to our most pressing gaps. Of any, health, of any sector, excuse me, health should have the most studies that we draw on, given the sophistication of the evidence that exists in more stable contexts and that can be applied and tested in different ones. Carl Blanchett and Bayard Roberts from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine wrote a recent review of research on health interventions in humanitarian contexts. Although there are indeed numerous studies in humanitarian contexts, they find that study design remains very weak. For example, the authors identified 32 studies on health service delivery, but only four that measured health outcomes, and even these were of low quality design. Similarly, they identify 56 studies on health systems, but a gap in the research on the effectiveness of different models of delivering interventions. You'll note that both these topics are ones raised about the case in Ebola. So what gives? Why is the evidence so weak in humanitarian contexts? Why isn't there enough and enough of the right evidence? Um, I offer a few suggestions. First, aid policy donors and decision makers too often remain focused on measuring inputs and outputs rather than the achievement of outcomes for people. In education, for example, the sector still measures success by the number of schools built, teachers trained, and students enrolled, none of which tell us whether children are attending school and achieving learning outcomes. Deciding the most important outcomes to achieve provides focus for both programs and research. Knowing the outcome all aid actors work to achieve for people is a critical starting point to identify both the current and needed evidence we need to achieve it. Second, as the Ebola story tells us, the supply-driven of sorry, the supply-driven nature of humanitarian aid uh, is of critical importance to research as well. Supply loses interest quickly as new crises, media, and domestic politics shift. You can see two similar trends in this slide. The first, the first part of the slide is IRC's program budget in Sierra Leone and Liberia pre during and post Ebola. You can see the increase during Ebola and the decrease after. The second is the same set of indicators for overall aid. Most concerning here perhaps is the decrease that we've seen recently. This supply driven nature, quite literally the donor driven or money driven nature of our ability to respond impacts the generation of relevant research because we rely on the same donors to fund our research and they lose interest just as they lose interest in funding programs, even if needs continue to be unbearable. This fickle behavior influences incentives for practitioners and researchers alike. Back to West Africa, the numbers of women and children that continue to experience violence are absurd. Most of the rigorous impact evaluations on prevention and response have, ex sorry, have been led by IRC. We have carried out 12 studies across 11 countries. 
But we couldn't and can't use this evidence to prevent what's now happening and continue to learn more when the lion's share of our donors have lost interest. Finally, the money that does exist is not aligned to consistent research priorities that align academia, practitioners, private and public donors to the most essential areas and gaps that we need. It definitely isn't the case that research isn't being funded in our context. This last slide offers a snapshot of the data I could gather on the funding available for research in humanitarian contexts. It's not easy to understand. There's no one place to find the major research priorities or programs that drive joint funding as individual donor priorities change over time and are framed in diverse language and frameworks. This is a critical piece of the evidence puzzle. The incentives driving research are instrumental in shaping the quantity, quality, and relevance of the knowledge we have. We need transparent, consistent, and well-defined research programs to help assure we don't waste time building ad hoc rather than cumulative evidence to help people. I hope I have contributed in some ways to the dialogue we are gathered here to have today, how collaboration can generate evidence to support response to humanitarian crises. The Ebola outbreak and response were watershed events for the global health community. We've heard today about the collaboration and investment that have brought the world closer to a vaccine, an incredible accomplish for science, the private and public sectors, and for the countries and people most at risk of future outbreaks. We need to figure out how to drive the same type of collective action and investment in other areas of research. The last two directors of the U.S. National Institutes of Health both popularized the need for what they called translational research to assure the benefits of modern biology and science translate into safe and effective interventions that improve people's lives. We need the same type of focus to change people's lives and drive a lasting, transparent prioritization of the evidence gaps we face in humanitarian aid. In the case of medicine, education, criminal justice, and psychology in the West, research is treated as a public good that citizens require, one that needs long-term commitment by the public and private sector, academics incentivized to focus on solutions that change people's lives, and practitioners equipped to both use the best available evidence and identify the most pressing gaps in our knowledge. We need this same type of community effort for the rest of the beneficiaries facing crises around the world. Thank you. Well, I hope you'll agree with me that we've received four outstanding contributions uh, in this area. The floor is now open in the time that we have uh, left for any questions, and I hope there are some because there's been uh, some remarkably rich thoughts given to us this morning. Any questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Gerd Antis from Cochrane, Germany. I think absolutely fantastic how do you presented the whole problem. But one dimension was undervalued. That's the risk communication in the rich countries. And we were in the position to really study that because the Cochrane Colloquium at that time was precisely in Hyderabad. So we could travel from Europe to India and see how the, the virus could travel with us, for example. There was absolutely no barrier to travel from West Africa to India, which was a re huge risk. And in the rich countries, it was very simple to observe the risk communication was almost always ping-ponging between no risk to every neighbor of your in Europe, in Germany, may have Ebola. And I think that needs far more attention because first, we have to be prepared. It was a complete chaos in Germany. It's good to see that Angela Merkel gets more credit here than in Germany. Uh, but second, we need the resources from the rich countries and that needs better communication of the risk. I wrote that in an article at that time. It was, the title was, uh, Ebola conflicts between Sorry, Gerd, can I move you to your question quickly, no. please? Yeah, the question is how do we motivate the rich countries to take that as their own problem? Because that hasn't happened so far. There's a lot of money going around, but it's not really on the table in the rich countries. I can at least say from Germany, in spite of the 
Paul Dwarf, Angela Merkel. Thank you. Anybody wants to pick that? Okay, let's take more questions and deal with them. Um, there's um, one lady at the back. Please go ahead. On the back. Is there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you. Yes, yes, you. <laughs> oh, hi, Trish. I, I thought there were four terrific presentations. Um, and I thought they raised an issue about the methodology of developing an evidence base in these hugely complex um, areas where we're working across sectors and we've got a very particular challenge, be it Ebola or whatever it might be. Um, and I was looking in the, um, you know, using the app, there's only five empirical case studies in the whole of this conference. Case study is not something that is looked at as a, as a methodology that is particularly valued by the people who are submitting abstracts to this conference. And it's just a suggestion that next year, let's have a bit more on the methodology of case study, particularly case study of complex intersectoral interactions. Um, you've got loads of, of, of orals on meta-analysis and things like that, but very little on, on the methodology of uh, rich empirical case study. Thank you. Point taken, and let, let's hope that's a precursor to a second Global Evidence Summit. Yes. Hello, I'm David Goff from the Epicenter in London. Um, I found that uh, the, this morning's session very um, inspiring, call to action for us all. My question is, um, we heard about these examples of these global initiatives, but uh, to what extent are other global agencies, like UN agencies, like UN Development Programme, um, taking on board these, these same issues to, to help us to use evidence to solve global problems? Thank you, David. I'm going to take the last two questions and then deal with them all uh, in the few minutes we have available for us. So yes, the two questions at the back. Um, hi. So first, I'd like to say a big thank you to Jody for raising the point about um, children education, because I feel like that's really important. Because despite the fact we're talking about vaccine development and all that, there's a human being with that behind that, so, and we need education for that. And so my question comes to um, John and Stephen in terms of, we spoke about illiteracy and, um, and education, so I'm wondering is there anything that's being done in terms of investing in education to, um, strengthen, the edu to strengthen that specific aspect in West Africa? And to John, the question is about, you mentioned that there's high um, vaccine development around MERS, Lhasa, and NIPA from the WHO R&D blueprint. So I was just wondering, how exactly do they come up with those three um, high diseases? Because as far as I know, unless I'm ignoring about that, is that there's no kind of disease surveillance in Africa, perhaps in high income country, but not in Africa. So how exactly do you know which disease to target and, and coming up with those three ones, especially in our context. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And the final question. Uh, hi, my name is um, Sam Johnson from the Cochrane Infectious Diseases Group. My question um, is, um, does the panel feel that there is an overemphasis on the biomedical research efforts, both in terms of preparedness and response to outbreaks, at the expense of research into, for example, um, the, the case that Stephen Kennedy um, uh, talked about in terms of the methods used in terms of case finding and the infrastructure involved that uh, is required to respond to these outbreaks. Um, and should there be more of a balance between that uh, funding going into those biomedical efforts versus some of the other uh, aspects of responding to an outbreak? Thank you. A lot there, um, but, uh, and we don't have very long, but, but, but quickly, um, I'm turning to panel members who, who'd like to kick off. Vasi. Maybe I could take um, a couple of those, um, and some of them also clearly relate to, to CEPI, and so John Arnhem will, will, may want to come in if the line is good enough. Um, so first of all, there was a question about how we derive the list of pathogens that is on the WHO R&D blueprint list. Well, the first point I really want to emphasize is that it, we, and I think everyone, is very clear that the next big outbreak you know, it, it's inherently unpredictable, and we just have to be absolutely transparent about that, what is going to cause the next big outbreak. So in the R&D blueprint, as far as possible, we are up front, um, always prioritizing whatever can be done which is not pathogen specific. That's the first point. Second point is totally agree 
that it, a critical, critical element of all of this preparedness is going to be strengthening surveillance systems and um, the quality of data that we have for signal detection. And more resources absolutely are needed in this. And there are a whole other set of activities that WHO and others that I didn't present on that are outside of the, I, I, mine was a narrowly focused R&D presentation. That's what I was asked to talk about. But there are many, many other activities related to strengthening the, the quality of the information, which is a critical need. The pathogens that we've selected are based on a, a number of criteria for the likelihood for a pathogen potentially to emerge and cause a really serious international or even global um, crisis. And also thinking that these are representatives of exemplars of different families. So if, if product development is, and research in, is in a particular pathogen area, it should be relevant beyond that pathogen alone. So for example, MERS coronavirus is an example of highly pathogenic coronaviruses, and many people think that's an area where we're, we're likely to have a problem in future. Secondly, on the, on the issue of this risk, I think this is a really important point that Gerd raised. Now, I, there's no simple answer to this, but that all I would say is that any of you who have any possibility to interact with those who are working in advocacy in the political sphere, we need to make the case that it is in the domestic interest of high-income countries to move into a sort of insurance-based thinking to devote some small proportion of their resources to address this issue. And the, the fact that CEPI has been able to partially raise some of their resources, I think, as John Arliss said, this is a reflection of this window of opportunity. But beyond that narrow window, we need a longer-term insurance-based thinking. If something is a problem over there, then it's clearly going to be a problem over here at some point in the world that we live in at the moment, but people don't seem to have still grasped that. If you have house insurance and your house doesn't get flooded and your house doesn't burn down, nobody thinks that your house insurance was a waste of time. So we somehow have to get this insurance thinking and we have to get this up into the political sphere and, and that will be the, uh, the solution, I think, if we can achieve that. Thank you, Vasi. Jody, anything to add? No, I don't know how relevant the questions were to the broader humanitarian case, so I'll, I'll look into it. I, I mean, I'll, I'll assume that there's some more relevance and speak to a few things. One, um, methodology. You know, I think, um, to be candid, I think part of our failure to form a cohesive discussion about evidence, uh, regardless of the sector, is, um, is a failure to recognize that different purposes of use of research are associated with different methods. Um, and so I, I think all methods have value depending on the purpose at issue. That's certainly what we've struggled with in humanitarian aid is getting lost a bit in, in research, in arguments about research design when really we probably need all of them to suit different purposes. So in the case of uh, making decisions about which interventions work best and at what cost, Case studies don't help us too much. They do help us understand what happened and why, um, or how implementation actually fared on the ground. So I, I don't know if that helps drive a methodology discussion at some point, but it is something that we often get tangled up in. Um, and then I think maybe the question about an overemphasis on, on, uh, on biology or on uh, drug development at the expense of response in other areas, I think that's the case across many domains. Um, and per, maybe consistent with everything we've talked about today, where there's crisis, there tends to be focus. And where those crises cross borders, and especially into the West, there tends to be a lot of focus and a lot of resources. So there is something missing in our balance of investment. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges we all face. Thank you very much. Um, Janana, Stephen, uh, a few seconds if there's, uh, if there's anything to add. Stephen, anything? Um, I guess basically I would just want to make um, maybe two or three quick comments. Um, <clears throat> one of the experiences we learned from the epidemic is um, the ability for Liberians to take ownership and leadership of the epidemics. And that has led to um, strengthening of the research infrastructure um, to the point where um, 
Liberians are playing key roles as principal investigators for large uh, clinical trials, not only for uh, Ebola vaccine, but also ZMAP um, and other um, therapeutic agents um, that can be of benefit to the um, future epidemics. The next thing is that um, the laboratory system has been significantly strengthened, the biomedical research lab. Um, we're doing as complicated as genetic sequencing, um, which was never available in Liberia pre-Ebola. Um, um, and I guess um, the last point is that um, the issue of point of care, again, differential diagnosis, fever remains one of the key triggers for emergence of infectious diseases. Um, unlike we uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, especially the West Africa, get away from malaria, um, there must be point of care diagnostic assays that can easily run in 30 minutes to be able to exclude or range maybe nine or 10 different conditions, say malaria, Ebola, dengue fever, uh, loss of fever, um, why um, nigh, you know, nigh, uh, infection mononucleosis, whatever, uh, chaka, whatever that is. Um, if, if that is possible, there's increased likelihood that we may be able to easily catch um, from the initial onset some of these uh, emergence or re-emergence infectious diseases, and then that can redirect effort on how best um, to approach them. Um, and the last I'll say is that um, despite um, the uncoordinated and, and political um, interest the struggle between the developing and international, developing world international organizations regarding research methodology, um, um, when to commence, what kind of study, what kind of design that I head all back um, to have learned a lot of information. But having said that, I must be very um, careful to indicate that what we know over this two years period between 2014 to 20, 2014 to 2016, is about a million times what we know from uh, 2013 to the onset of the epidemic, I mean, onset of Ebola in the 1970s. So the, the evidence is huge, the knowledge base is huge, um, and we are making effort to be able to address some of the unknown questions. So that is a major medical milestone during this two year period, and we must take advantage and run with it as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but I hope that you've, um, uh, you think the extra five minutes from your coffee break was worthwhile. Can I ask you to thank our speakers and uh, hope that all of you have a great day.